Hello everyone and welcome back. It's finally time to write our first web API using Django. We're going to see how to set up two endpoints for our API. The first one will allow users to retrieve information about a specific product instance. And the second one will allow users to retrieve a list with all the available products in our database. As we've already mentioned in the first part of this lesson, we're going to build our API views only using the functions and classes provided by pure Django. And our API will make use of the JSON file format. Let's get started. Here we are in Visual Studio Code and as you can see, the views.py file of our products application is here open in Visual Studio Code's workbench. As we've said in this second part of the lesson, we want to develop two API endpoints for our online store project. Both endpoints are going to use the JSON file format and the first one is going to allow our users to retrieve information about a specific product instance, while the second one is going to provide a list with all the products that are available in our database. So the first thing that we need to do is to define two views, which are basically going to use the JSON file format to provide the same kind of information that the product detail view and product list view are now providing using Django's templates. So I can just comment all this code because we are not going to need it anymore, but you might just want to check it later on. And we need to import a very important class instead, which is the JSON response class from Django.http. So import JSON response. We can have a look at its code by right clicking and then selecting pick definition. And of course, as the name suggests, JSON response is an HTTP response class that consumes data to be serialized to JSON. We're going to talk in great detail about the serialization and deserialization process later on during the course. For now, let's just focus on how to make all of this work, okay? We can use function-based views to make the code as explicit as possible, and we can start by defining our product list function view. So def define product list, which is going to accept a request parameter as for all the function-based views. And because we want to provide a list with all the products in our database, we need to get the product query set. So products equals product dot objects dot all. If you want to, you can also just get a slice of all the products available like so. And we're now facing our first challenge. How can we set our products query set in order to use it with JSON response in a meaningful way? Well, Python gives us the dictionary data type, and so we can use that. Data, I'm going to define a dictionary, which is going to have a products key, and to the products key, I'm going to assign a list containing the values of our products. So products dot values, and we can also select some specific uh, attributes for our instances, such as, for example, primary key and name of each product. We can now define a response object using JSON response and our data dictionary. And we're now ready to return our response object. Now that our product list function is ready, we can finally set up our first endpoint. And we do it the same way we would normally map a function to a URL. It's the same thing. So just going to import the product list function. So we can just comment this out. And so from views, I'm going to import product list. Or rather, I can just delete one, even two, because we are not going to need that one anymore. So this is going to be products and I'm going to assign it the product list view. Typically when defining an API endpoint, we would normally use the API prefix, let's call it, in front of the rest of the endpoint. It's best practice and it allows us to distinguish all the different paths in our project. So I can just go and modify the urls.py file of the online store project and I'm just going to add API. So that starting from API forward slash, we're then going to include all the other endpoints that we're going to define. 
So let's try this out. I'm going to execute our code. Our development server is running with no issues. So let's move to Chrome. And of course, at the moment, it gives us page not found because we are in the home page, let's call it. We need to go to slash API slash. And of course, you see, we now get a list with all the available endpoints. We can therefore go to slash products. And here it is, our JSON response. It's a JSON object, which as you can see, contains an array with some details of our products. Of course, we've decided to only show the primary key and the name for each product. Therefore, that's everything we're getting. Let's go ahead and change this from within our views.py file. You can just delete or just maybe comment out this code. Let's rerun our development server. No issues. Perfect. Let's make another get request, in fact. And here we get all the details of all the products in our database, in this case, two products. You see, we get, uh, first of all, of course, the ID, the primary key of the product. Then we get manufacturer ID, meaning we get the primary key of the manufacturer of this product. We get name, description, price, shipping cost, and we even get the name of the images that are assigned to our products. But it's easy to understand that this is not the best way to actually deliver information to, let's say, a UI client. First of all, talking about images, we see that we only get the name of each photo. We don't get its actual URL. While, for example, using Django's template, we can just use .url to get the proper URL for each image. And same thing we could argue for the manufacturer. We only get its ID no further information. We might want, for example, to show the name of the manufacturer, which is way more valuable to a customer than its ID. So as we can see, the JSON response class is really useful, but it's not enough for real world scenarios. We would need to heavily tweak our code in order to actually show the information that we need. And that's why we normally use something like Django REST framework. However, let's get the best out of it anyway. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code and let's define the second view that we actually need in order to build our second endpoint. So let's make this one too function based. So product detail, which is going to accept the request parameter, of course, but also the primary key parameter, which we need to actually determine which product we need to show the details for. So considering that we need the details of a specific product based on the primary key that's passed, we also need a way to find out if that product actually exists. We could use the get object or 404 shortcut, which is really useful. However, it is better if we define the try accept clauses by yourself. Because this way, we can also specify a JSON response to send back if the product doesn't exist. So, try product equals product dot objects dot get with pk equals pk. We can now define a dictionary with all the details of this specific product that the user is looking for. So, data equals a dictionary product and here let's define another dictionary so name it's going to be product dot name then we're going to have manufacturer product dot manufacturer dot name and we can do the same for all the other attributes so description is going to be product dot description then we've got photo and this time we can get the URL of a photo. So we can do product.photo.url, which is provided by the field itself, by the image field itself. Then we got price. It's going to be product the price. And then we got, I can just maybe do like this. So we got shipping cost. Is going to be product dot shipping cost and quantity product dot quantity and now that we've got data we can also define our response as json response of data 
So this is all good, of course, in case this specific uh, object exists. So we need to tell the client if the product doesn't exist. So accept product with capital P dot does not exist. In that case, response is going to be different. So it's going to be response based on JSON response, but with a different message, of course. So we can define error like so code. So the error code 404 not found and then message product not found. And if we want to, we can also pass a status. So status 404. We got no universal guidelines telling us how an error response should look like. Talking with developers from different companies, maybe different industries, and of course, looking on Google, you'll find that there are different school of thoughts. And the way we've defined our error message here is actually one of the most common ones. Our response is basically divided in two parts. We got status 404, which is important to tell the client, meaning the application that the resource we're looking for doesn't exist. And then we got this JSON, which provides further information to us humans. We got a verbose message, product not found, and then the code 404. So anyway, whatever happens, we need to actually return the response, right? So return response. So let's save and let's define our second endpoint. So I'm going to import product detail and so here we can define our second endpoint. It's going to be products. Then we're going to need a primary key, like so. And of course, we want to actually call the product detail view. And the name is going to be product detail. So let's restart our development server and let's give our new endpoint a try. So I can just minimize the terminal. Let's go back to Chrome instead. And let's say we want the details of our city bike. Okay, so I'm going to go to slash API slash products slash one and then forward slash. And you see now we get all the details of our product very well. We see that we get the name of the manufacturer first manufacturer and we also get the URL of the image that is associated with this bike. A UI client could now, for example, go ahead and grab this URL using it to show the photo of this specific bike to our users. And speaking about images or media files in general in the context of a REST API, I want to point out that nowadays is pretty uncommon for a company, let's say, to develop an API for its services managing images on its own. It's much more common to actually use a third party service like Firebase, for example, or AWS, which will provide all the needed content to your customers based on their location, for example, with a CDN, a content delivery network. And the services are also getting really cheap nowadays. So if you're serious with a project that you intend to build, I definitely suggest you take a look at those services to provide media files to your users. So before finishing the lesson, let's go ahead and let's try to get the details of a product that we know doesn't exist. Like for example, a product with primary key three, which we haven't defined, which we haven't created yet. So here it is, we get our error code 404 message product not found. Very well. So that was it for this video. We've seen that it's actually pretty easy to use the JSON response class to create simple APIs using Django. However, we also see how this is not the most flexible solution one can find. And it's also important to point out that we've written only two views, we've created two endpoints to get information from our database. Just imagine how messy things could get if we, for example, would have to provide our users the ability to maybe create new instances and in general perform different kind of actions on our platform. Luckily for us, the Django REST framework package makes all of this really easy. And we'll get to the details of how to use it in the next session. But before that, we've got our competency assessment. So see you in the next lesson.